Today is Wednesday, October 2nd. Uh, this is one of our fields that we own. <laughs> Welcome to our, our Badger Plots cover crop site. This is a pretty much a research site, although some of the things we're researching we're still learning, so <laughs> bear with us a little bit. Um, and that uh, it is a jointly sponsored event by NRCS, who's not working today, uh, Land Conservation Department, and UW Extension, and uh, the UW Extension Specialist. Um, Legacy Seeds is also here with Dave Robison to talk a little bit about uh, the, the structures, below ground structures of, of some of these common cover crops. And he's been a partner with us because I didn't have the money for all the varieties of seeds that we put out here, but uh, uh, thanks to a lot of their excellent donations, we were able to do this on, on, a, on a very affordable budget and not have to charge anything for events like this. So. I, I hope you appreciate that as well, having a, having a free event to come, come to. Um, so the focus of our research here is that, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the design layout, is to establish the most common cover crops in, in Dodge County and in the systems that people are trying to, to uh, shift to and shift towards. And what we have over here is we have 12 different cover crops. Some of them are cocktails, some of them are independent cover crops. And the reason why we established them in this randomized block design and also in this garden plot is because we're following the NRCS Agronomy Tech Note 7. And I'm not going to say it's the Bible on cover crops, but it has some pretty good basics as far as some of the advantages and disadvantages of cover crops, which we're going to talk about today. The first six plots up front, starting at the John Deere tractor, um, which is very nicely painted, by the way, um, we'll show a map of the plots. But basically, we're going to do a little walking and talking this afternoon with our with our specialist from UW through each variety. And they're triple replicated, so the first two rows are 12 species, the second two rows are 12 species, and the, and the, and the back two rows. We've dug holes into those because the owners here, Jeff and Jerry Kreisinger, brought a backhoe out for free, of course. I always ask for anything for free. And uh, he wouldn't stop digging. And uh, even yesterday, he was running around with a soil probe in the sand. We couldn't get our soil probe back. So he was very much interested in, in uh, compaction and what some of these cover crops are helping him with. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff and Jerry standing over here. If you could say just a couple words about your crop rotation, your strip till unit, and anything else you want to say for a few minutes. Better get Louie caught found <laughs> out Louis first. Louie's not <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> we, uh, we actually started all rich tilling in the first year or two. Uh, and then uh, we kind of switched over to rich tilling. But uh, we, at first we had, a, we had coulters on the planter and strip till. And then in about, we did that for four or five years. And then we went to a separate strip till machine where we basically made the strips. And then we followed it with... Uh, Actually, the first couple of years we got the strip till the separate unit. We still had coulters on the planter, so we really had uh, we had two coulters on our strip bar and two on the planter. And then, kind of after a while, when we went to this uh, 24 roll planter, we don't really have anything on the planter now. Everything's on the, roll planter. on the separate roll planter. Yeah, we have a roll cleaner, but uh, we don't have any tillage on the planter anymore. In fact, we don't even have uh, fertilizer just um, And this this farm, well, hasn't had any tillage since the '91. Other than a um, little bit where the ring cart <coughs> tracks are, or the headland we might drift that a little bit, but otherwise it hasn't had any tillage. And we do still have a lot of compaction problems, and uh, especially behind the where the planter and the stripper go, it seems to be the worst. We don't feel our combine's giving us as much trouble as the planter and the, and the strip bar. Um, but there's, you know, we have compaction problems in them, in the wheel track, which we're slowly trying to deal with. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, well, I guess the uh, 
deep tail is not the best answer for compaction, so we're hoping that we can figure something out with the cover crops. Um, we, we played around a lot with the nitrogen, and it seems like with the no-till, we need to put our nitrogen on sooner. We moved more of it up front than what we used to do before that. And they, right before that, we were just we were chisel plowing, trying to fall through one. Usually a pass with the field cultivator in the spring and then plant. But you're going to hang around yet for the rest of the afternoon, so if anyone wants to chat with these gentlemen, they're pretty passionate about uh, about what they do. So I, I want to extend a huge thank you to you for letting us drive a whole bunch of vehicles all over your, <laughs> your field and, and having us all traipse across your land. So. One of the reasons, well, we started out, you know, um, we had one farm that was all rock, and if we chisel plowed it, put in hydrosun, it took us two days to clean it up and plant it. And now we can pretty much go in there and yeah. in the morning and be out in the afternoon without two guys in a payload or in a truck picking the stones. And plant, but yeah. we do a lot of drainage work and I get to be, I get in the 10, 20 pits a day when we're doing drainage work and it's pretty obvious the benefits of um, trying to control erosion. We see a lot of brown dirt on top of six inches of black dirt. Yeah. It's, un it's unbelievable how much dirt's moved. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of committed to the, we, we think we're doing better than we're doing, but we got a lot of improvement to be had yet, I think. But. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I want to really get everybody in the hole, so to speak, and I want to introduce this gentleman all the way from Indiana. I'm uh, Dave Robison with uh, Legacy Seeds and PlantCoverCrops.com. Got a uh, got a blog. At least the radio's not turned too loud. So, <laughs> um, oh, been working with uh, Midwest Cover Crop Council for the last eight years, and working with cover crops for probably the last well at least 15 years. Uh, we weren't necessarily calling them cover crops that long ago. We were trying to extend the grazing season for beef cattle. Uh, flying in cover crops into uh, corn that's at about the stage across the road there and and uh, harvesting uh, or letting cattle graze the oats, rye, and turnips afterwards and uh, saw um, cattle gaining three and a half pounds per head per day over the winter time without feeding any hay. So that was a little further south than here, uh, but yet we've uh, seen uh, this last year up in the sands uh, some uh, some different cover crops flowing into some seed corn area and, and uh, gentleman was able to graze until uh, around Christmas time uh, this last year so uh, uh, that happened again this year and and uh, looking for a lot of opportunity for whether it be for animal agriculture or if we're quote unquote just trying to build soil health um, I do come from Indiana we uh, have a home farm in central Indiana where I grew up on and graduated from Purdue University went back to the farm uh, in the early 80s and if any of you remember the early 80s <laughs> yeah, there's a reason I'm here. Um, <laughs> drought of 83, drought of 88, drought of 91, dr yeah, anyway. But, um, but nevertheless, I um, have been involved in agriculture my whole life. Uh, a number of years ago, I was at a uh, field day um, in uh, southern Indiana, and I was with a lady named Dr. Eileen Kladivko, and I was very much into the forage uh, part of the production of cover crops. And looking at some uh, rye grass and and your rye grass that was about waist high and just drooling on what that would mean for a dairy farmer for production and milk production, and uh, Dr. Kladivko kept pointing my head down to the soil pit, saying, "What's most important is what's happening beneath the surface of the soil, not what's above the surface." So, as we look at the cover crops out here, you can go, "Well, yeah, they're not very tall." That really doesn't matter. And uh, we're going to look into pits here in just a few minutes and see how deep we can get roots with really, relatively shallow or relatively short cover crops and a relatively short time period. So before we do that, I've got uh, on the bales of straw over here, I've got our cover crop guide. It is a guide. Yes, in fact, it has some legacy information in there. But there are lots of guides in here as well, benefits uh, that could be beneficial. What to plant after corn silage, what to plant after soybeans what to plant after wheat or other cereal grains and so forth, and then giving some different options. Uh, in a field like this, the toolbox was wide open because we were following wheat. Thus, we could plant Sudan grass, we could plant buckwheat, we could plant some things we might not 
plant after corn and soybeans unless we're doing aerial application. We're blessed today to have Damon Reby with us today who does a lot of aerial application in the area and I've been working with Damon for a couple of years now and, and it's been a real treat to be able to do that. But uh, nevertheless, we're, there are some grand opportunities to aerial apply cover crops as well and have seen a lot of success with that. Um, in my home plots, uh, I live in northern Indiana and I've got an area that's not very big, but I do a lot of experimenting in that, in that area. So I did peas and radish at two inches, peas and radish at one inch. I uh, did crimson clover aerial applied, put on top of the ground, crimson clover and radish, it was a half inch deep, crimson clover and radish, it was an inch deep, and did all sorts of different planting experiments on seeding rates and, and so forth. Not real big plots, three foot wide by 10 foot long, but enough to figure out some information that, uh, and replicated some different things. So I like to do a lot of research, work with the universities a lot, do a lot of work with NRCS and so on water. And um, the, the key is, is that if we can build our soil health, we can build yields and we can also build profitability. Uh, the work we did on our home farm uh, harvested last year in the severe drought, the average uh, extra yield we got where we had cover crops versus no cover crops was an additional 42 bushel an acre. So that was with multiple cover crops. This last Monday, a week ago yesterday, my brother and I hand seeded walking through soybeans. We simulated aerial application on about five acres worth of uh, cover crops, looking at about uh, 10, different spe well, 10 different species, plus a check plot. Everything was replicated three times. And then we also uh, put on another 15 species and varieties to look at just to get an idea of how those would work. But the idea is, is the more we know, the more we can gain to be able to share information with farmers to be able to figure out so that everybody that's doing it can be more profitable.